Welcome to the Multiply Your Success podcast, where each week we help growth-minded entrepreneurs and franchise leaders take the next step in their expansion journey. I'm your host, Tom Dufour, CEO of Big Sky Franchise Team, and I'm wondering as we open how well you think your company's processes or systems happen to be documented. And one way to help figure that out is if a key person in a key role were to leave your organization today, Would it create a vulnerability to your company? Our guest today is Ryan Nidell, who we wanted to bring on to talk about creating processes and systems to help your business. Now, Ryan is a CEO, board member, and an entrepreneur, and he's also the leading authority on improving revenue of companies by improving EBITDA through increased operational efficiency, lean manufacturing principles, and more. He's helped with the acquisition or exit of more than 11 companies while seeing their collective revenue surpass more than $237 million. So this is going to be a great, great interview. I think you're really going to enjoy Ryan's perspective on how you can scale and build businesses with your process. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. My name is Ryan Nidell. My title, I get to wear two hats. So I get to be the CEO of MIT45, which is one of my companies, but I also get to have the hat of general partner in Columbus Capital Equity Group, which is my private equity fund. So a little bit of both. Very interesting. Well, one of the reasons I was interested in having you on the show, you have a 148 proven profit processes that you talk about. And so I'd love for you just to explain what that is and start talking through that. Yeah, Tom. So those proven profit processes, right? You like alliteration, so do I, those those multiple Ps. Those are a life's learnings into what has made me successful and sometimes not so successful inside of business, right? Because I look at the history of started in the automotive industry in the illustrious world of automotive sales. I was a used car salesman, right? I can I can water it down a little bit more. Jumped into web hosting and entrepreneurism, sold a couple companies. And I've had three, four exits of my own so far and have helped, gosh, 11 or 12 other businesses exit themselves. And it's just shown me there's there's literally a duplicatable process to to maximizing profitability. And some of those processes are consistently thinking about what you're thinking, right? What are those inputs that are coming in where there is value? And I laughingly say that small hinges swing big doors. And that's certainly not my saying. It's It's something that's been shared by so many people before me. But if we can increase your marketing efficiency by 5% and increase your closing ratio by 5%, and decrease your cost of goods by 5% or your cash conversion cycle, the waterfall effect of that starts to become pretty exponential. And there are different things you can look at in all of those. One of those, right, as we look at client acquisition, we look at the marketing side, which I think is a great place to always start. It's how are you marketing your product? Are you focused on a true customer experience? Are you maximizing lifetime customer value? Are you simply looking for a transactional sort of relationship? And if it's transactional, I always encourage to build out a brand, right? To build an ecosystem that invites someone in. And certainly there's many ways to do that, right? We can use a Discord community. We can use a Facebook group. We can use private software. We can use an email list. We can use ManyChat or WhatsApp. There's so many different ways nowadays to start to build that, that loyal fan base, right? It's a thousand raving fans really creates a different environment for any business to thrive in where you start to then use those raving fans to become affiliates or referral partners, right? Are you incentivizing people that already know, like, trust, and respect you to bring their friends and family in, right? To just lower your cost of acquisition. And then as we go through a sales process, how are you maximizing that average order value? And whether that's, you know, you're a restaurateur, which is a great profession. It's almost like the the McDonald's Old, old McDonald's thing, right? Would you like to biggie size your fry? And it's that small, small little increment or the assumptive close of, and what type of ice cream do you want with your meal? Even if you haven't ordered an ice cream, there's so many of those little incremental processes that can be added to any business where it doesn't sound like much, but that extra dollar fifty for that ice cream cone across a long enough period of time, it really maximizes what that profit looks like per customer. And so that's some of those, those 148 and that list keeps growing. And sometimes I take some stuff off of it. So I don't want to, you know, sound, sound too high on my own horse right now, but it's just the acknowledgement that every business, every industry is this great way to learn. It's a great way to learn something new. And then to see how readily those lessons can be applied to other industries is, is a really scalable process. Interesting. So with this 
148 proven profit process? Is it kind of like a checklist for you to kind of review it and see which might apply to your own business? How have you found different businesses or clients you've worked with use this process? Yeah, Tom, a really, really good question. So I do use it a little bit like an internal checklist. Now I get to cheat a little here, right? Because on one side, I buy businesses. And so part of it is I'm going through my due diligence cycle as I'm interviewing the leadership teams, as I'm considering what's possible, I'm seeing how many they they probably don't know, which is beautiful because that's that's that hidden hidden enterprise value that I know I can typically pick up pretty quickly, which is which is a beautiful blessing into itself. The other side of things is if I actually own a business or I'm coming to consult or some things differently that way, I'm literally just going through these 148 items and seeing what fits and what doesn't. And not everything is applicable to every business, of course. I need to also acknowledge that. And some of them are very simple. Like, do you have a proven sales process that you've documented and then revisited at least twice a year? Most entrepreneurs know say, oh yeah, absolutely. Like, okay, can you show me the document? Well, there's a lot of tribal knowledge. You see my sales guys are doing... So the answer is really no. And it, it starts with the boring stuff, right? It's that success swing singles type of conversation where it's the things that you do consistently and you get just a little bit better every day that really create a massive windfall in the business that I'm a part of. And so, Tom, it's just a way to say thank you for being on the show. I would love to, to give you that 148 you know, item checklist. Feel free to, to pass it through. If anybody wants it, they're more than welcome to it. I don't need anything for it. Just a way to say thanks. Well, I appreciate it. And certainly we'd love to take you up on the opportunity and share that with folks who might be interested in just reviewing their own business. As we help companies franchise, that's always a question that comes up. What kinds of things should we be looking for? And it'll be a way for us to bet how we're doing with that and bounce it off of what you're doing. I love it. Coupled with that, I had a question on is why it's important to create some of these systems. And I mentioned folks are thinking of franchising. I think whether they're growing as you've grown with businesses you've owned or invested in or through franchising, there are some universal practices that need to be applied. So talk a little bit about why that's important in creating these internal systems. Yeah, Tom. So the internal systems aren't sexy. I I apologize as you were listening to Tom and I's conversation where this is a little bit of like, oh gosh, another system-based conversation. This is like the anti- anti-exciting part of the conversation, but to me, it's probably the most important where as you start looking at your business and whether it's a franchise or, or you're an entrepreneur yourself, if there's any part of your business where one person could leave and create a vulnerability, that's an area in which you should document that process, right? And there's the documentation, there's, there's typically this thing that happens inside of an organization where you start talking about, gosh, have you documented your processes yet? Have you created, like one of my companies is MIT 45. So we call it the MIT 45 way of doing business. So it's everything from how to park in the parking lot and secure the building to how to, how to confirm inventories arranged the right way, all the way into how to ensure an exciting customer experience and what that follow-up looks like. And the part about a process is it's never complete, right? It's, it's that quintessential done is better than perfect. And so as you look at things as an entrepreneur or a franchise owner, to me, that's one of the brilliances of franchising is you literally create that playbook and that playbook becomes the duplicatable, replicatable way in which you've conducted business, which is why I absolutely love what you're up to and how you help individuals do that because it's it's so infinitely scalable and you don't water down the quality of the experience for a customer, which is really to me what the documentation is all about. I do it a little more on the micro level, right? It's more an internal basis where gosh, if I have to shift people around or let's say, for instance, my CFO wants to take a a month-long vacation. Well, I think my CFO should be able to do that. But do we have the checklist in place? Do we have those SOPs in place so that when she steps away, we're at 90, 95% efficiency without her being there. We can follow the playbook and know that, gosh, the, the, the train's not falling off the tracks because we don't know what we're doing. And there's just a lot of tribal knowledge that happens, especially and I've been a part of some really fascinating rapid growth organizations where you look, you know, 5 million in revenue, 12 million in revenue, then 30 million, then this year was, was 77 or 76 million. And what ends up happening, Tom, is each new year is like an entirely new business. And if you unfortunately don't document some of those processes as you're growing, a lot of times I found the staff that got me from 5 to 11 million probably isn't the same staff that's going to get me from 11 to, to 70. There's, there's going to be some piece, some parts where I love helping people learn on the job. But at some point, learning on the job is not as efficient and effective as having someone in the role that's already been there before. And so Mm -hmm. it's that that tribal knowledge back and forth. 
I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what's unique about the RNS approach to growth and some of these things you're doing. He's kind of started hinting at some of these things, I think. So I'd love for you to talk about that. It's easy to start by saying, right, what's unique is the fact it's my way of doing things. And, and in, inherently, I think as entrepreneurs, we don't give ourselves enough credit for that, that our tenacity, our, our forward thinking, our glass three quarters full all the time, there's a lot of actual value in that where someone like yourself, someone like me, I laughingly say, you could probably put us anywhere on earth. And as long as we had a cell phone connection and a couple of dollars in our pocket, we could figure out a way to start making money. That's part of what goes into this RNS solution, right? The, the Ryan Idell system if you will. And that that starts from having this Socratic method of analyzing a business, right? It's it's assuming that I'm the dumbest person in the room at all times. And I don't say that flippantly. I, I generally mean it. When I step into a business, just explain this to me like I'm a, a seven-year-old child. Explain to me what you do, how you do it. And then let me walk through the process from start to finish, right? And just literally just ask questions. And sometimes that interview process, Tom, is, is a half a day. Sometimes it's a week, depending on the complexity of the business. And it's not to poke holes in it. I'm not looking for things that are wrong. I'm generally curious, like, how do you get into the business? Why did you get into the business? The staff that's around you, how did they come on board? How long have they been here? When's the last time you've analyzed their pay? Is it in the proper pay bands? Do you have a bonus structure put in place for them? Do you have SOPs in place? What's the customer life cycle, right? There's just questions that come up from a level of curiosity. Then I'm able to, by taking those questions and I'd like to say analyzing them, it's really just reviewing them. I start to look at those versus those, you know, 140 plus profit multipliers and say, okay, here's some areas of opportunity, whether it's a consulting basis, whether it's a friend basis, whether it's I'm looking to acquire the business. All these things end up really tying together pretty nicely, where it's just asking questions and being humble enough to say, I've got some experience in life, but I don't know everything. If my wife was on here as well, she would say, I don't know half as much as I think I know. So I'm keenly aware of that as well. That's phenomenal. Well, we've been talking about franchising a little bit. I'm always curious how you would apply these kind of growth systems into franchise type model with some of the different things you're doing, the proven processes and so on in that franchise or franchisee relationship. It is unique relationship where the franchisee owns and runs their own business, but they also are following a process and they have kind of their own unique things that they do, but everyone's kind of doing the same thing. How do you see something like what you do play into a franchise model? Yeah, Tom. So I've been fortunate enough to help out from an advisory role, a franchise that's Clean Eats. It's a, it's a national healthy healthy food kind of restaurant and, and pieces and parts like that. And the two co-founders became friends and allowed me just to, to poke around, ask questions, right? Try to understand. And what I noticed was that the franchisee franchisor is beautiful, right? That relationship with, okay, I can walk in any clean eats and it's the same font on the menu. It's the same menu in every store. The layout's roughly the same. And that is fantastic. But as I went to a store in Akron versus a store in Columbus versus a store in Wilmington where they're founded, the experience was much different in every one of those environments. Now, the experience, and what I mean by that was, what was the process that I went through as, as a consumer? How was I greeted was it was there a logical upsell process? Was I was I walked through as a value added customer, or was it just a transactional experience? And the big difference is the Wilmington store, where right they're they're founded out of. It's you start feeling like family pretty quickly. They want to know your first name. They want to know where you're from. They want to know why you're in the store if you've been there before. And it doesn't sound like someone's reading off a script, right? It sounds like someone generally cares. And then I look at an Akron-based store, and it was a one-off situation. There's no, no judgment to this. But the Akron store was really, what can I get for you today? And that, that was that was the sum total of the conversation. And so what I was able to really uncover with that, Tom, is it's great to have that franchise model from, from some of the, the high level, right? The branding, the offerings, things like that. But how much can we expand that model where the franchisor is able to bring information back to the franchisee as well and say, hey, in my market, these sort of things are working really well, or my average order value is way outside the standard deviation that's going on right now. And as I'm looking at our comparison, right, they do some really great analytics across every every franchise in, in the country where they're actually comparing. So they're, they're learning from each other on what's working and what's not. So it's right, what are effective labor hours? What's the average order value? What's the reorder rate? Some things like that that end up having massive value that when you're able to start figuring out those, again, it sounds like a broken record, but those really small incremental changes, right? It's the franchisee has already 
to me, done a lot of the hard work. They've done the heavy lifting. They've got an established business model that's really successful. But that franchisor, there's there's some uniqueness in every industry, in every market to me. Like the, the Columbus, Ohio market is certainly different than the Wilmington, North Carolina market. Different way people spend money. I mean, gosh, it's it's miserable and gray here in Columbus, Ohio, as I speak to you. And it's not miserable and gray in Columbus there's, or in, in Wilmington. So it's a different mindset when someone walks through the door. And so it's really maximizing the marketing prowess, maximizing the sales process. I look at franchising is, is great for the, the operational and the service side of things. I look at every business. I keep things really simple. Tom, every business is marketing, operations, sales, and service. It's the Moss method to me. There's only four things to focus on. Now, each one of those might have 50 or 60 things underneath them. When you really get right down to it, there are almost four legs on the table. If you spend more money on marketing, you're hoping that sales increases. But if your operations can't support it, the table starts to slope on one side and things break down. And then if you can't maintain those customers with a high level of service, the whole process breaks again. No different than if you bolster up operations too much and you're too focused on that and you spend no time on marketing, no time on sales. Well, the best operation in the world won't matter without customers. So it's really just applying some really simple leverage points. What's the efficiency of your marketing spend? What's the throughput on a customer? And then what's that, what's that lifetime customer value? What are we doing to create, the, again, those raving loyal fans and again, this is a one-off situation where it's a, a food store, it's a restaurant. And so it was instituting a loyalty program. It was instituting reward points. It was putting different point systems on slow turning inventory that had higher points to incentivize people to, to buy them a little more frequently. It was then renegotiating with suppliers to drive down our cost of goods because we're getting those cost of goods for every one of the 70 plus stores instead of some of the one-offs. So all things that I know you, you help people with, like I don't know that I'm reinventing the wheel here. Just some really simple things of, to me, it's just questioning everything. And it's not asking questions is different than questioning, I should say, right? I'm not questioning the, the two founders of Clean Eats. They're brilliant. I'm asking questions to understand, which then allows me the opportunity to share some different thought processes. I love the detail you went into there. And this would be a great time in the show for us to make a little transition to where we ask every guest before they go the same four questions. And the first question we ask is, have you had a miss or two on your journey and something you learned from it? Tom, I think a miss or two would be would be underselling how badly I whiffed at some of these endeavors. So I certainly have. I'm 38 years old now. At 29 years old, I sold my first company. I sold a web hosting company to a subsidiary of GoDaddy. And I was convinced at 29 years old, I might as well have been the reincarnation of King Midas. Everything I touched was just destined to turn to gold. Well, to get to the punchline, it certainly wasn't the case at all. So I, I launched a merchant processing company, a high-risk credit card processing company that specialized in some of the obscure online transactions. Think gambling and gaming, things like that. Really high risk, high reward. And in 18 months after launching that business, my vehicles were in repossession. My two rental properties were in foreclosure. I was writing a, a multiple six-figure check to shut down the business. And I was laying off or, or terminating all my employees December 21st, where the lessons I learned from that, right, really a pretty solid misstep, where I didn't build systems and processes. I didn't have a level of duplication of my business. So the only sales that were being generated were being generated by me, which is fine. But I didn't have an operational specialist at the same time to fall behind me to help clean up some things. So I would close a customer and nothing would happen. And I'd have to keep putting on multiple hats versus creating a leverage of really finding people that are brilliant in those industries, in, in that specific vertical of the business. Another lesson I learned from that is, I, I struggle with this one, but it's really not to put, I, I don't like to slide all my chips at this point to the middle of the table. I'm not always gonna bet on black, right? So so I literally, with that that ego I had at 29, I was just convinced I'm gonna take this these, these winnings from my first business, I'm gonna put them to the center of the table and I'm gonna triple them. And I'm going to sell this next business. It could take me three years. I got the entire plan mapped out. And 18 months later, there's no chips left on the table. And I'm, I'm really, I think, 40 or 60 grand in the hole as a net worth. So some pretty quick lessons that have stuck with me today, where now it's that measure, measure twice, cut once. It's be more intentional with my thought process. It's map out a desired destination and see, am I the best person to get myself there? It, it's really some of that Dan Sullivan training of who, not how. Right To me, so much of life now is who's the person that's best at that, not how do I get there? Because they already know the how. So a couple of lessons, lessons sprinkled in there from a misstep. Oh, thank you for sharing. And let's look at the other side. You've shared a little bit about this, but let's talk about a make or two that you'd like to share. 
Yeah, Tom, so thank you. The, the make that I would say in this moment is, is my company, MIT45. And the company, MIT45, I came on as a consultant. We were at a $5 million a year run rate. As we wrapped up 2022, as we're having our, our conversation now, our financials are looking like just a little bit more than $70 million in revenue. And as we've done that, we've kept our marginalization consistent. And while the numbers are all well and good, the biggest win for me isn't any of that. It's pivoting our corporation, our, our company into a corporation and going through and doing a stock issuance for all of our employees and really acknowledging the fact that it's the power of the sum total of the whole that got us to where we're at. It's not me. It's not my partners. It's not any individual contributor. It's the collective brilliance of all of us together. And so by, by seeing those fiscal wins come up, it starts to present this new opportunity of, gosh, there's going to be an IPO in the future for us. There's going to be some sort of large capital gains event. And while it certainly is going to feel good to win at that level, it's going to feel a lot better to have the line worker that's making our product get five, six, seven times annual salary as a check. It's good. But these are things that really, really alter people's trajectory and what they're capable of and help create a level of generational wealth for them. So that, that to me is the biggest win. It's I'm sure, Tom, you can you can relate to this. You get to a certain point inside a business that the difference between a million dollars and $10 million is just another zero on a balance sheet, right? It's not, it matters, but you just kind of get numb to it. But to see a coworker's face light up when they see a sheet of paper and says like, I literally, I own part of what I've helped build and I'm, I'm going to get paid from this. And like the tears and the emotion, Tom, is probably the most meaningful day of my life in, in, the, in the past 38 years was, was that stock issue and stepping into the fourth quarter of 2022. That's incredible. Wow. What a huge, huge win. Well, let's talk about a multiplier that you've used to grow yourself, your businesses along the way. Yes, Tom. So the biggest multiplier for me has been really removing myself, right? It's multiplication by subtraction. I think it's natural. I, as I look at my trajectory and some of the business I've been a part of, right, there's that hustle phase that I know you and I, and, and as you're listening to us, we're already past that phase, but that's like that zero to a million, maybe zero to 5 million. You can kind of strap the business on your back. You can work harder. You can work longer hours and poof. You got If you got a good market message match or product market fit, you're going to be at the million to $5 million range. It's just kind of what happens. But then as you start growing more and more, that five to $10 million range, that, then I start to look at other people. You need some other people to help carry carry the boat, if you will. But then that 10 to 20, it's really, gosh, I, I don't want to make the decisions anymore. I've got great people around me that I need to start decentralizing every decision. That starts to become a leverage point, right? And it, it's a challenge as, a, as an entrepreneur, especially if you, if you started from scratch. It's like, gosh, I, I've risked everything. I put all my chips on the table or whatever amount of chips you've decided to put on the table. How do I know that the people that I'm that are supporting me are going to make the right decision? And the answer, quite frankly, is you don't. You got to create those guardrails, create those systems and processes to allow people to, I'll say, fail forward, fail gracefully. Right. And to me, I don't know about you, Tom, but I've learned from my missteps, probably even more than my successes. And so allowing some some simple ecosystems inside of the business in which not only is there leverage on me, but there's leverage on the people that support me at the C-suite level, where authority metrics and signing metrics. So there's there's scalability. So really the, the multiplier is me getting the heck out of my own way and being able to think further and further down the road, right? I need to be 18 to 24 months ahead at all times and use chief of staff and some people that support me to be more involved in the day-to-day -day operations. Ryan, the last question we like to ask every guest is, what does success mean to you? Yeah, so success means to me being able to do what I want, how I want, when I want, with who I want. And so that success is a combination of the systems and processes that are put in place for a business, right? If, if I, Tom, if I said, gosh, buddy, let's, let's take a trip down to Mexico tomorrow. I'm buying. And can I do that? And can I step away for a month from my business and know that the business will probably succeed beyond what I'm doing by being involved in it? And then in that, am I able to travel the way I want to? Like we could, we might be able to take a Greyhound, you and I to, to Mexico, but that doesn't sound all that exciting to me. I'd rather, you know, fly private. And so can I come pick you up on a jet? And then we go down. And then, you know, you've got a couple of buddies that want to come too. So how, how do we all get to go? And it's certainly there's a fiscal component to that, but there's a lifestyle component to that. There's, am I spending the right quality time with the right quality people? Are there people that are dragging on my energy or adding to my energy? And it's consistently auditing that to get, I would say get rid of, but to help the people that are draining my energies kind of fall to the wayside or get to speak to somebody else. And the people that add energy to me, I want them around me all the time. So that's that's really what success looks like to me. 
Ryan, as we bring this to a close, is there anything you are hoping to share or get across that you haven't had a chance to do so yet? I've been fortunate to be interviewed on a couple podcasts, and this is really me speaking to myself. And so hopefully there's there's something in it for you as you're listening to us. And that's you're capable of far more than you've ever given yourself credit for. And that if you can find that one person, if you can find that that mentor, you can find that inspiration that can hold a slightly higher belief in you than you have in yourself, it's amazing what can happen and what can transition. And so if that's someone like Tom, if that's someone you know that we've never even ex- experienced before, I just look at my own life and say, man, eight years ago, I was flat broke, like a negative net worth. And it took a series of events. It took me recalibrating my mind into what I thought was possible and having people along the way that kept saying, no, you're better than how you're showing up. You're capable of more that that really started to open up a new reality to me. And so if there was something to leave, it's it's really that the story that you tell yourself in your mind creates a, a preview of coming attractions in reality. So if, if you think you can't, you're right. And I think if you can, you're right. Right. That old Tom Ford saying. Thank you so much, Ryan. And how can someone get in touch with you, get in contact if they're interested in learning more or, or just connecting? It's just ryanidel.com. That's R-Y-A-N-N-I-D-D-E-L.com. Or any social handle, right? LinkedIn, Twitter, all, all the big ones. It's just Ryan Nidell. I keep it pretty simple. And all I, I'll share on social or on my email list is just what I'm up to and what's working and also what's not. So fortunately, I don't have an offer. I don't have something to sell. I'm not going to solicit you to buy a bunch of stuff. It's really just a way to add value back to the world. Ryan, thank you so much for a fantastic interview. And let's go ahead and jump into today's three key takeaways. So takeaway number one is when Ryan talked about his proven profit process, and he described that there is a duplicatable process to everything you do. And I love that quote that he said, small hinges swing big doors. Takeaway number two, and he said, well, why are systems important? And he said, well, it helps create an internal system. If someone leaves your company, it could create a vulnerability if you don't have some of these processes documented. He also said that getting your process done is better than perfect. So getting something in place is better than perfect. And I know at our organization, when we help our clients document their process, we like to apply the 80-20 rule as part of what we look at when we go through that, where we we look at what are those 20% of activities that are producing 80% of the client's results or that position's results. We want to document that 20%. That's the most important thing. If you're going to spend any time anywhere, focus on that. And you can backfill all the other things later. Takeaway number three is when Ryan was talking about the RNS method. Part of that RNS method is that he asks people to explain to him about their business as if he were a child. And he uses the Socratic method to ask a bunch of questions. And he shared that he has a 148 question process that he takes people through. Lastly, he said part of that RNS method is to be humble enough to recognize that you have experiences in life, but that you don't know everything. That final takeaway on this part is that He said, asking questions is different from questioning. And I think that's great if you are the questioner, but also if you're the person being asked those questions to understand what is the true intent of the person asking those. Are they just asking questions or are they questioning? Now it's time for today's win-win. So today's win-win came from the very tail end when Ryan said, you are capable of more than you've ever given yourself credit for. I thought that was just a great way to close. And I'd like that to sit with you for a minute and just repeat that to you, our listener. You are capable of way more than you've given yourself credit for. And he described that situation for him where he had started a business, sold it, took all of His proceeds invested in a new business because he was very ambitious and, as he described, overly confident. And he put everything he had into that business. And 18 months later, he was shutting it down and out of money and flat broke. And eight years later, by changing his mindset after that incident, he's now at a place where he owns multiple businesses and is very successful in terms of his outlook in life and career and 
all the various things that he's doing, so much so that he shared with us how he's taken his company and issued stock in the organization to all of his employees to share dividends to them as the company makes profit. And so that's the episode today, folks. Please make sure you subscribe to the podcast and give us a review. And remember, if you or anyone you know might be ready to franchise our business or take their franchise company to the next level, please connect with us at BigSkyFranchiseTeam.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to having you back next week.